Oh. All righty. Um, Liam, I think you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, so should I do any kind of like introduction in general or is this, I uh, just start with myself? Yeah, just start with yourself and then we'll, yeah, you can just start. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Liam Baum. I am a educator and musician and creative coding enthusiast. I have been a P5 teaching fellow this 2023 year, and my project was focused on curriculum building for P5JS and specifically the P5JS sound library. Um, I was basically looking to do a continuation of the available curriculum for what was available for P5JS, which currently is the introduction to computational media and also the work of Lila Quinones, who did the interactive sound art curriculum uh, as a P5 scholar as well. She was a um, fellow for, I believe, 2018. Um, so what I wanted to do was to explore the aspects of the P5 sound library, which have not yet been covered in any of these curriculums in the introduction to computational media or the work of Lila. So specifically what I was looking to do was look at sound synthesis, which is sort of generating sound within a P5 sketch as opposed to uploading audio files, which was something that has been covered more in both of those curriculums. Uh, another thing I wanted to do with that was to look at P5 as more of a music making tool, myself coming from a music making background. And actually that was my entry point into coding was when I realized that it could be used for more creative musical endeavors, such as making instruments or making kind of interactive instruments like that. So my focus of this curriculum was to create interactive sketches or to have students create interactive sketches that could be used for music making. Another focus that I wanted was to have it be more intermediate level. I feel there is somewhat of a void of these mid-level, intermediate level curriculum materials. And part of this, I think, is a lot of CS teachers, at least within the New York City area where I reside, um, who are coming to teaching computer science from more of a beginner to intermediate level. So their skill set is also sort of coming from an intermediate level. And I think uh, that is important to sort of provide those tools also for students. I think there's also some very strong available beginner level curriculum for P5JS. And I did not wanna necessarily contribute to there being more of that, but sort of providing extensions of places that teachers could go once they have kind of worked their way through that beginner level curriculum and then offer students some more intermediate level. Um, and beyond the basic concepts of sound synthesis in the P5 library, I wanted to have them uh, explore other skills that are useful in CS. I don't want to call them soft skills, but uh, more people skills, I guess. Um, so getting students to think about things like decision making, design, accessibility, and becoming more self-sufficient as a programmer. So looking at documentation and being able to kind of come up with a idea and give them the knowledge to know how to execute that idea without actually just telling them how to do it, but giving them the tools to figure that out on their own. When I started the fellowship, I had a lot of ideas and basically just started randomly sketching out different concepts and lessons that I wanted to use and then started sorting through that and grouping them into different units for what I felt would be cohesive. Um, this was a very interesting journey. It was kind of scattered at first uh, and just sort of getting out all these thoughts that I had had leading up to doing this fellowship. I would often start with one lesson and then that would evolve and become two or three lessons. And it just became a lot of material uh, in the initial few weeks that I started with. Um, so I had a lot of ideas. It was spread out over like three different units at one point um, with multiple lessons for each. Then fortunately, after meeting with uh, my mentor, Luisa Perea, who was also um, 
very instrumental in the creation of the first iteration of the introduction to computational media curriculum. Um, she offered me some really good advice to just focus on finishing the first unit so I could have a good solid starting point and at least a finished product that could stand alone, even if other parts of the project didn't ultimately get finished. So my final project is that first unit. Um, I do have uh, quite a backlog of other lessons and units that I would like to put together at some point. Uh, but as of now, the finished project is this one first unit, which I'll show and go over in a minute. Uh, but in mentioning Luisa, one of the highlights I would like to talk about for my fellowship was the ability to really collaborate and interact with a lot of amazing people who gave me so much inspiration um, and ideas and really helped me to kind of sculpt what the final project wound up doing. So Luisa was obviously one giving me that direct Direction, um, I was able to interact with um, Aaron Montoya Moraga, who is the P5 Sound Fellow, and they gave me a really good idea of where the sound library is going. So right now it is under some reconstruction uh, and there are certain things being taken out, certain things being added or deprecated. And it was really important to me to make sure I knew where and what was gonna be there when the curriculum was finished. So I wasn't writing lessons for methods or objects that were ultimately not going to be in the sound library anymore. I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Courtney Morgan, who was another P five teaching fellow who was working on updating the curriculum, the introduction to computational media curriculum. And she was also able to give me a really good focus and also help me to streamline the work that I did with uh, the work that she had done. So the final project that I have is very much in line, uh, both in look and in organization as the introduction to computational media curriculum, which was important. I also had the opportunity to um, work with some of my cohort, um, specifically Nat and Bobby Joe, who were focused on an accessibility project. And upon talking to them uh, and just their initial presentations of the work they were doing, that really got me thinking about wanting to incorporate some accessibility uh, or some lessons regarding accessibility into my own work as sort of an additional thing to have students thinking about beyond just the basic sound uh, library elements of that. And that was really eye-opening and the talk I had with them really helped to guide some of my ideas and just open my eyes to more concepts around accessibility in general. So that was something I was able to work in to the structure. Uh, in addition to that, I had an opportunity to speak to a friend of mine, Elias Sardonis, who is a um, UX designer, a user experience designer. And I was hoping to incorporate some design elements into what I was doing as well. And he was really helpful to give me some insight into that element. So I'm going to share out now uh, what I have. I can open this up. Let's see. I've got to apologize. This is just granting uh, security access, I guess, here. This is happening on a new laptop, so I'm having trouble showing uh, that. Oh, somebody, I don't know, Sagay, if I could just drop you this link. Okay. 
going to be able to share. I can kind of talk through it. See, I just got this new laptop. It apparently does not want to give Zoom sharing rights. Okay, so yeah, this is the introduction. So I'm talking about what this curriculum is, which is basically everything I've said there and kind of scroll down the focus, um, talking about sound synthesis. So this is pretty much this culmination of uh, everything that I've just said so far. So you can see there on the left, it's eight lessons. Um, we start with just an introduction to the basic oscillator object, um, which is sort of the foundation for sound synthesis. From there, we get into just changing frequencies, uh, changing amplitude. So some basic methods that go along with that and getting students to think about that. So yeah, you can scroll down through here. So all the lessons include an overview, objectives, durations. One of the things I really wanted to focus on was New York State standards, which is becoming uh, a big push in computer science, at least within the New York City area. There's a whole new set of standards. So making these lessons align to those standards was important. We have vocabulary, extensive planning notes for those folks who are going to be using this. Uh, materials, resources, there'll often be references to introduction to computational media lessons as well, as well as P5 references. There's assessments that are built in as well as any new code. Um, you want to go back up actually one thing about the, so the resources specifically go down there we go. So the resources, um, I try to link often to introduction to computational media lessons in that being a intermediate level uh, curriculum, I don't want to be reteaching certain concepts. So the idea was that if you are using this, it is meant to be kind of an extension of beginner material and introductory material. So I'm not like introducing concepts of like how to use the canvas or anything like that, or how to make a shape or colors, RGB values. Those are kind of assumed knowledge, but there is always links to those introduction to computational media lessons in the event that a teacher might need to brush up on it. But this unit is meant to, it can be self-sufficient, but it can also be an extension. It could be kind of taken apart and used more piecemeal as just extensions for specific concepts. Um, so I really wanted to make it versatile in that regard. Um, and you can go down just to get an idea. There's do nows, uh, warm ups to kind of start classes off. Uh, there's always links to materials and things like that. Any videos, references, YouTube's qualities of sound. Um, and you can just continue to scroll. So uh, this is just to give an idea of what certain things might might touch upon. Uh, but there's always code examples. Um, and references like that. So if you want to go over to lesson three, uh, this is, so this is one of the lessons. So basically the way I kind of broke this up is it's chunked out in kind of three main portions. There's sort of the introduction of the code, and then there's a bit more in regards to a beyond coding kind of concept. Um, so thinking about in this lesson of how we could make a accessibility of something that is sound based to people who maybe are unable to experience sound in a specific way. So that being the deaf community, the hard of hearing community. And so this specific lesson takes a look at uh, the artist Christina Sun Kim and the work she has done around closed captions. She is a deaf artist who does a lot of work uh, sort of about the deaf experience and specifically their relationship with things like sound and music. So we use her work as kind of a starting off point to look at how uh, closed captions can be used. And this is a lesson that I was really happy with um, that came out of the talks I had with uh, Nat and Bobby Joe to just kind of get students thinking about accessibility in a bit more of an approachable way, just kind of using things that we had already done. Um, and there's always wrap ups, there's extensions. Um, one of the other things 
I think I'd like to highlight, you can stop there, Sigay, thank you, um, was uh, this idea of coding with care. And this came also uh, through some discussions with Luisa, my mentor. This idea that coding is really about people and decisions that people make and people who interact with the code that you make. So the idea of care kind of became a, a central idea throughout this unit specifically of that we are designing with care we are making decisions with care and those that care needs to kind of take into consideration the people who are going to use our code because ultimately that's what the coding is about so code doesn't kind of exist in a vacuum it does exist uh, as a result of people making decisions and those decisions will ultimately go on to affect and impact the people who use their their work and the things that are made with that code and i think through things like design through accessibility i tried to highlight that to get students thinking about this idea of being conscious of the decisions they're making and to hopefully get them to make more careful decisions that will ultimately impact the people using the code that they write. So uh, that is where I'm going to wrap up. I could certainly go on for for a long time and talking about what we did here, but um, it is available through uh, Gitbooks. Um, I'm sure the link will be made available through P5 uh, website and the Processing Foundation. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and I'll be here after a presentation from Olivia and Kelly to talk a little bit more. Whoa. Um, thank you so much, Sam. Um, Kelly, how about um, the two of us introduce ourselves and then um, I can share, we have a slide presentation that we can go into a little bit, um, just kind of talking through um, both the like theoretical and technical ideas that we'd been working on over the past couple of months um, and some of the things that we learned throughout our process. Um, yeah, do you wanna go first to you? Nope, not you. <laughs> um, okay, hi, I'm Kelly. Um, I have had the pleasure to work with Olivia um, for our processing fellowship project um, for the last few months. I am an interdisciplinary researcher and curator working and living in, on the slides it says Boston, but I recently moved to Providence. So I'm branding myself Providence <laughs> person now. Um, and in my art practic practice, I mainly work with archives, data, hardware, software, um, and my interests recently have been in the histories of computation and craft and noise. Um, so like sound and music as they re relate to labor and authority and political and economic systems. Um, yeah, and I've had a great time working with Olivia. Um, I've taught theater for like a few summers now to students and that's kind of where I was coming from with our project. Yay! Um, I'm Olivia, um, Olivia Ross. I'm a video artist, programmer, poet, um, information worker um, from Jamaica, Queens. Um, and a lot of my work these days is really um, considering kind of power and media theory um, and really thinking about care work across transmission culture um, and specifically um, thinking about like video faith and power and how that has to do with memory and how we remember things and how we safeguard things. Um, and so I do a lot of work with both archives um, and also with computing technologies um, in my video practice. Um, this fall and summer, um, Kelly and I have been working um, on a project through the Cybernetic Opera Company called Cybernetic Theater in a Box. Um, I will begin sharing these slides. Oh no, sorry. 
will begin. Sharing this. Sharing the slides. Can you guys see that? Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. So the Cybernetic Opera Company, um, which is currently Kelly and myself, is an experimental performance group and pedagogical collective. And we specifically arranged uh, ourselves in this way, both holding performance and pedagogy together, um, because we wanted even kind of in the like thesis of the work we were doing for there to be an implicit connection between like teaching and learning um, and that conversation and also in performance, because that is kind of um, in a kernel, like a lot of what the philosophies that pushed us are about is kind of um, deconstructing the dichotomy between who the audience is, who the performer is, um, and kind of both in the concepts of a normal theater and also um, thinking about that in the concept of computers. And so who's the audience or the user and who's the programmer or the actor? And even in saying those words, like you can see that there are things to be flipped and that these are slippery labels that you can apply to things. Um, I can also chime in. Um, so for cybernetic, cybernetic theater company in a box, um, we pitched a collection of performance scores and drama games, um, basically curriculum materials for youth that expand what we commonly think of as um, software arts education. Um, and it really starts them with movement practices and like really understanding the terms that are being used. Um, in in processing um, and when working with computers um, and to connect it just really quickly to connect it to what Liam ended with with coding with care um, where we came from was that when you learn how to code and when you're being taught how to code it's important to remember that these are yeah it's ex exactly like decisions that people are making and that people will use this code and interact with it and that code exists for people and will impact people um and in our cohort of processing fellows it's been really inspiring to see everybody else just engaging with um the poetics of computation and alternative ways of teaching and alternative pedagogies that really allow students to play and to use storytelling and creativity as access points for learning and teaching this program. Um, and the way that we went about looking at accessibility is the different access points that people have to the education itself, like how, um, like the classrooms that they are that they have accessible to them, the spaces that they have accessible to them, the language that they have accessible to them. Um, so in a brief overview, um, through the Processing Teaching Fellowship of 2023, um, Kelly and I really got to dig deep um, into a lot of different modalities of engaging with um, with the ideas that we were researching over the past few months. Um, the most kind of fully didactic version of this is a two-day workshop schedule for youth between like 16 to 24, where we take you through a very, very um, kind of laid out roadmap of um, different accessibility points to, okay, how do we go from are sitting in our bodies and performing as you know actors and directors um, and exploring um, different ways of expressing ourselves through performance in that way and how do we connect these routines to the ways um, how do we connect these routines to the ways that we engage with computers right the computer routine versus the theater routine we, through the workshop, are basically working to collapse those two ideas um, to allow for more like embodied play um, and also um, a really deeper understanding of like what these underlying systems of computation, how they work, um, and 
how they can use them as jumping off points for new ways about thinking about art and new ways of thinking about um, like com computational problem solving. Um, going down the list, some of the less um, guided um, pieces of the curriculum include these coding example templates um, that use P5JS in order to kind of um, teach people how to use technology and we, we elaborate this on this later in the in the presentation using technology um, and giving them examples that they can play with that really show how they can be an extension of yourself as a phys almost as a physical prop but in the kind of cyberspace world how you can use for example, the sound library as an extension of your voice, how you can use the camera data as an extension of your face and your body, um, and how to um, use the keyboard and mouse to kind of extend what your hand, what what the touch of your hands means in terms of how it affects the world around you. Um, we also compiled a reading list, um, and we'll be compiling both the performance scores that are generated from our workshops and the collaborations we have with kids, as well as performance scores that we own make up for a zine, which will all be com com included in this how-to manual for building a cybernetic theater company in a box. Yeah, um, and then I'll just like go back to the beginning about the workshop schedule. We came up with a fantasy weekend workshop schedule um we are hoping to do this um to run this in the spring um in our processing fellowship time we mainly ended up honing in on writing code and building out these materials so that we can um run the workshops as we want them um but basically our fantasy two-day workshop um kind of reflects we were thinking a lot about the theater experiences that we had um, and, or like the theater workshops that we have taught and really taking from the structure of those types of days where, you know, students come in and they, you know, drop their bags, they stretch, they get to know each other, they have conversations with each other about um, who they are, why, why are they here, what are they interested in, and with that cohort they We'll play games with processing, write performance scores, and um, eventually move on to using Arduino um, on the second day. Um, the first day was, is mainly like debriefing the activity, um, getting to know verbs and words that are being used in processing, ending with um, a, a, Olivia and I demonstrating um, some games and then the day after they get to either write their own games or continue to play these games and see where they go. Um, and we can get into the specific games. Um, so kind of, um, I wanted to explore a bit of our process. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to, can you guys still see the screen? Oh, okay, great. Um, Cause I was trying to pull up notes at the same time and it started glitching things around. Um, so kind of taking through um, our, oh, I lost the screen now. I'm really sorry guys. Okay. Um, yeah, kind of going through our original process is cropped to the right side. Okay. Um, yeah, so our process was really, um, really holistic in the way that um, we spent a lot of time kind of researching and trying to um, really build a curriculum that was able to syncretize between theory and code, because this was something that we knew from the start would be really, really difficult to kind of communicate to the like groups that we were most wanting to work with. For a lot of time um, for youth who are between like the ages of 16 to 24, even though they might be ready for more advanced computer science instruction, oftentimes the idea of pulling in ideas in critical theory 
or in media theory or performance theory is a jump that they haven't had to make in earlier classes. Um, and so we really wanted to um, be really clear about our language, be really clear about um, how we go from point A to point B and connecting these ideas um, and not making things super wordy, super heady um, in a way that would be intimidating because that conflicts with the entire goal that we originally had in making both theater learning and computer science learning not as intimidating as they might have been to someone. Um, and so we, um, we started kind of from that place um, and through consulting with our mentor, Lajne McMillan, who gave us a lot of really great um, advice and seeds for kinds of um, similar organizations um, that we should speak with um, through talking to college students at Cooper Union, the new school, Hunter College, um, and NYU, and kind of, um, probing them to see like, what are the things that they feel like are missing? What would be intimidating about engaging with a kind of curriculum like this for the first time? And in using that information to kind of um, inform our spiral and inform the ways that we were designing um, and programming the curriculum. Yeah, and we also looked, again, we like looked back at, um a lot of like really traditional theater games and the way that theater workshops are laid out. And when we like get to talking about our games, it's like pretty evident that they are like really direct adaptations of very traditional um, theater games, like stop and go, verb games, um, like miming, mirroring games. Um, we, we also took a lot of inspiration from this organization, Barefoot Computing. Um, and their whole thing is coming up with ways to get students engaged with computation with um, like tactile classroom objects and like posters and cards and also games. Um, and yeah, we really inspired by the different ways that you can pull computer science into the classroom with objects, um, yeah, with like objects and that students are already familiar with. So some example games. Um, these are kind of the more real life games. Um, Kelly, do you wanna go into the descriptions of these and I can do the more code-based games? Totally, so Stop and Walk, um, our cybernetic verb game it takes from a theater game that is also called Stop and Walk um, and the way that the students play it is that um, the participants just start by like walking around a really large space in any direction. They can move in between each other from one corner to the other in big or small circles, just like do whatever they want to do. And there's a caller and they are in encouraged to just like say verbs that the students might already be um, familiar with, walk, run, stop for a few times um, just to get them warmed up to respond to those action calls. And the participants are encouraged to enact these body uh, verbs with their bodies before, you know, reaching for a device or reaching for their computers to do it, to really think about like what the verb means. Um, and then we can start to integrate some um, verbs that might be used later while working with processing, um, like, any like computer-based verbs um like to download something <clears throat> to join something to update something to delete something um to merge to join to clone to split um to really like think about how you are enacting these verbs so that when it is time to go and do it with processing or with p5 um you have this like deeper embodied understanding of what it means to use that verb um, and our reflection questions for this is you know like what verbs have double meanings and what does that and how does that verb operate in the digital space versus with the body and which were the most difficult to interpret with the body um, and hopefully this first game gets students 
to start thinking about, you know, the functions and processes of systems as they relate to physical activity and um, how computational project processes and choreographies um, relate to technology. Um, and our second game, um, it's not on here, but our second game was a snowball game. Um, it's basically using P5 to snowball data and functions to create- Oh, that's in the code like, games. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, well, maybe you can cover that. <laughs> um, I can go down to square dancing. So when we were thinking about the square dancing game, we were thinking about how line dances and I'm I'm thinking like the cha-cha slide, like any, any, like <laughs> any line dance with just like a list of activities and functions, um, get students to think about the way that like actions and functions come together to create an object that works in a certain way. Um, and this is like kind of similar to the stop and walk game in that we would run through the line dance, but change up all of the functions in it. And just to see, um, yeah, <laughs> time warp for sure. Um, like, yeah, just like using the line dance as a template for thinking about functions and actions and how they come together um, to create a program. Um, and yeah, it is a it is a time warp. I think it, it's something that students are probably familiar with. It is just like a different way of thinking about um, actions coming together to create a program. Mm. So did I mute myself? No? Oh, great. Okay. I meant to, but I didn't. So I'll keep talking. Um, for the coded games, um, some of the examples that we have to talk about um, include the snowball machine, coded masks, and the megaphone. Um, a snowball machine kind of comes out of the idea of um, being able to make something once and have that thing that you've made once be repli replicable. Um, it's kind of, um, this is a similar philosophy that you'll see in a lot of object-oriented programming, which is the idea um, that through a blueprint, you are able to, a blueprint or a class, you're able to replicate these objects um, and you know, create things of larger scales than you were initially able to create before. Um, this is one of the ideas um, in computation that is often like a bit of a struggle for students who are new to computers to really understand. Um, and we thought it would be both a really, um, really fun to kind of integrate drama and performance-based learning into the coded application of that idea rather than just having it be um, something that you do in real life because the real life example makes a lot of sense. You can think of the blueprint for a car and how you make a blueprint for a car and then suddenly you know how to make cars and you can make them by using the materials um, and kind of just making more and more of the same thing. Um, but when that idea translates into the computer sphere, it starts to get a little bit fuzzy. So through the snow machine, which there's a screenshot of it on the right, um, we kind of basically allow um, allow students to um, kind of make their own special effects um, in the kind of drama technology lens. And in order to do so, they make different kinds of snowflakes. So they're kind of layering um, different forms of um, designs for snowflakes. And then as they pile them on top of each other, um, they're able to kind of create a snow machine that gets increasingly, increasingly complex um, and kind of serves this dual purpose of one kind of reorienting um, the students to computers as like machines that can be expressive and that can kind of supplement their own um, performances, right? Now that you have a snow machine going on in your background, you can perform a stage play that's about snow potentially. Um, 
in kind of um, getting them used to the idea of computers as kind of a, um, a prosthetic limb um, and that extends their reach um, while also allowing them um, through the rest of these games to also interrogate what that means for a computer to be a prosthetic limb and what does that complicate about your relationship to the computer and what does it enrich about your relationship to the computer. Um, so following that, um, the idea of a coded mask um, takes on both um, kind of ideas about, you know, color and shape um, but and, you know, R RGB values. Um, but it pulls them into this idea of mask play, which is a really, really common way of um, teaching and learning in drama classrooms where students will put on masks um, and then kind of have to act through the character of that mask. Or sometimes they'll be wearing a mask that has no character um, or no eyes or no mouth and have to um, engage the audience and engage their other actors using their bodies. Um, and so... Um, the screenshot here is one of many um, of these kind of software mirrors that we have like P5 templates for students to kind of remix and make their own. Um, and through the remixing process, they're able to have like a really hands-on engagement with um, ideas about like for loops and how do I change the you know color value of every single pixel on the screen in these different ways. But then we also, um, can pull in like these like facial facial recognition models so they're able to say I want to have um, this specific I don't know star or other like shape that they might make in p5 to be hovering over my eyes or to be coming out of my mouth when I open it or these kinds of things um, and so it also starts to um, it's one of those games that we're excited to engage students with um, yeah, um, computers as like performance tools. Um, and P5 has a lot of libraries that make that a really seamless process. Um, and the last one of the megaphone um, is more straightforward in the fact that it doesn't um, take much for students to get going. So it might even be something that's done at the start of the day. Um, but this uses the P5 sound library um, in order to kind of create a megaphone app for the students. Um, and so through like playing and remixing and commenting and commenting out um, lines of P5 code in this toolkit, they're able to um, make a megaphone that repeats the things they say, like an echo or plays them backwards or, you know, um, lets them like queue up different things that they said to play at different times and kind of um, experiment with making their voices higher or lower or things they, they say repeated even slower than they originally said it. Um, and kind of just expanding their reach through the different senses. Uh, That is the end of our presentation. Um, but yeah, I guess we're open for answering questions. And also, um, Kelly, if you have any last words. That you yeah, I, th I think just like expressing like general gratitude to have been yeah. part of the cohort. Thank you, CK, for organizing. And thank you, Olivia, for being such a great partner. Thank you, Liam, for sharing about your project. I'm definitely interested in like moving our games onto Gitbook. Like it just looks so good <laughs> yeah. on there. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, that was the format that the Courtney Morgan um, was using to kind of transfer the original ICM over to uh, that. And yeah, what I had before was just like all these different Google docs you know i was using the uh computer science for all uh departments official template and just kind of structuring but it was like yeah so hard to kind of go back and forth it's and i was constantly like re-referencing stuff from other lessons and this just totally streamlined the process in a way that made my life so much easier and yeah i would highly recommend looking into that as a way um i know um 
Joanna, another one of our cohorts, she was using a different platform, which looked very interesting. So, again, do you know what that's called? I forgot the notion. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, which looked very interesting, but um, it seemed a, I just didn't have the bandwidth to kind of learn a completely new platform. Um, it also seemed like it was very much geared more towards student work as well as curriculum as like teacher facing stuff like the student facing stuff is also kind of built into that so i think um within a classroom setting it's like there's a lot you can do with it where i was just sort of looking at teacher facing materials um but yeah i would definitely recommend that um i just wanted to say i really like uh points that you all were making um this idea of like these concepts you're teaching are not like you're not teaching the concept in isolation as just a like here's a for loop and we're gonna do this so we can learn what a for loop is it's like or like here's how we change the rgb value of a pixel in a on the screen it's like you're using it as a means to an end um and then it's like once you've successfully executed that concept you still get to engage in the end result in like a creative and meaningful way where it's like this is actually was just a way of getting us to this new tool where now we can kind of interact with it through the medium of theater as opposed to like just we're trying to code and kind of see some synergy in what i'm doing and like using uh music as sort of a vehicle it's like okay we're going to learn how to you know map a value to the mouse but that is ultimately going to result in some sort of like instrument that we can then engage with in sort of a fun and creative way so it's kind of like this wonderful synergy of like the code is just a tool to get you to the goal of whatever the artistic medium whether it's music or theater or art but then also it's like the art is kind of like the applesauce that you put the medicine in where it's like you're using that you know sort of the framing of this artistic medium as a way to then also sort of feed these concepts of coding and this sort of way of interacting with code that I think a lot of students and adults probably aren't necessarily aware of or don't really know like kind of like i remember the first time i used it used a for loop was to like iterate through a musical scale and it made like perfect sense to me it was not this weird abstract thing i was just like oh that totally makes sense and you know that really kind of changed i never had to like think about the abstractions of a for loop after that because it was just presented in this very like tangible way that was like meaningful to me so i think it's great that you found like this idea of theater and code i think is is really interesting i was just like writing down a whole bunch of stuff here like the this concept of like theater i love the idea of like the traditional theater games i did a lot of theater in like high school and early college years and just like i I like that you're not like reinventing the wheel in terms of theater, like trying to come up with these very, you know, like kind of idiosyncratic ways of how do we make combine code into theater. You're like starting from a very clear like this is theater and we're just now going to sort of modify it slightly, which I think is going to be a great entry point for students with theater backgrounds. It's just going to feel like very familiar to them. Totally. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I really liked the overlap. And I, I liked how you were saying interacting with code. Like, I think that's something that really struck me was what does it mean to write code versus interact with code? And like so much code exists already um, for us to like look at and interact with that you can learn so much just by playing with, yeah, like playing with stuff that already exists and like thinking about the code that we already interact with on our every day um and yeah just like really thinking about our like everyday interactions with code um however simple or complex that might be um and like what we can learn from it um i'm really i'm curious if you already have any plans for implementing this in like schools or like have you been in touch with any like teacher teacher groups um, um about in your curriculum yeah i mean some of it has been stuff i've already done uh and 
this was sort of a nice opportunity for me to really kind of like fine tune it and hone it in. Um, I am definitely looking to kind of get it out there right now this year. I'm part of the CS for all leads program through the New York city department of ed. Um, so I'm planning on reaching out and asking to be able to do some kind of like workshop or at least just present the work that I've done. Um, last year I went through the Hunter CS uh, continuing education certification program. So I'm one of like a handful of teachers right now in the state who's certified to teach computer science at the K through 12 level. So that's a network that I'm also going to try and kind of reach out to and just make them aware. I know P5 is, is a very popular tool in those circles as a teaching tool. Uh, through some processing foundation, Creative Coding Fest is also a place where I probably intend to do some workshops and just kind of create some awareness around it. Um, and we'll kind of like break it up because I feel like I'd love to do workshops in which I actually kind of teach the lessons themselves. Right now, I don't have a lot of CS on my plate and my teaching load. It's more music focused. Uh, so I want to do that because one thing, is, it's one thing to write curriculum, but it's another thing to then teach that curriculum and then be able to really see kind of where the holes are or where the things you thought were clearly explained. Then students are like, I have no idea what you're talking about and you have to really then go back and kind of reconsider what works and what doesn't work and that to me is sort of the the best part of writing curriculum is to put it in action and then kind of see does this do what I thought it was going to do you know and it never is but sort of where the you know where the things you thought were going to work weren't going to work and you know there's certainly a lot of new ideas i kind of inserted into this that i do want to see put into practice either and it's also i don't have as much experience getting having other people teach my curriculum i'm very stubborn in that i'm always writing my own curriculum and i don't like using kind of pre-prescribed curriculum like that um, so I certainly know what it's like to teach it, but I, I'm very interested to kind of see other people interact with it and then get their feedback, kind of what works, what doesn't work and, and the like. Um, one question I had for you though, on, on kind of on that note is I'm very curious about the process of curriculum design, knowing you get to work outside of an official academic institution, because I feel like a lot of my curriculum design is very much structured under the assumption that this is going to be taught in a classroom. And, you know, there are certain expectations of teachers within that classroom, like there's administration to answer to, there are standards that need to be met, you know, like you could get observed by an administrator at any point while you're teaching this curriculum. And so as someone writing it, I certainly wanted to make sure that all the ducks are in a row so that anyone who wanted to use this could do so and be able to sort of present it to a formal administrator and be like, you know, if they call into question why you're using it, I certainly don't want to put anyone, let alone myself, in a position where it's like, you know, what are you doing? And I think in some ways that kind of limits what I can do or what I want to do. Um, to make sure, you know, like, are there assessment points, are there checks for understanding and stuff like that, where it seems like what you've done is much more free and kind of has, a, you know, there's just so much more possibility and the end goal is much more sort of like just this creative experience as opposed to like an assessment or like a lesson that needs to be taught where it's like the ex you know you have to give grades at some point in the marking period and you have to justify why you gave that grade it's just like there's so much bureaucratic red tape that goes along with developing a curriculum in this style that uh i'm just was like salivating at the possibility mm -hmm. of like oh just being able to kind of plan something where it's like you don't and i mean i don't i'm i'm curious as to like where how how that development of a curriculum was for you like if that was anything you take into consideration or sort of like what your main objectives or end goals or just the overall design of a curriculum is like when it's outside of you know a formal academic institution 
Yeah, yeah I think it definitely like our project acknowledges that there is like more formal space for CS learning if it's like goal-based learning or um, if you like want to learn to build a like very specific thing um, but like personally like the most rigorous teaching experience I have had was over the last two summers I my partner and I have been teaching Shakespeare in two weeks basically like we get a bunch of kids whatever age like literally like K through 12 and mixed bag every time we have no idea who's going to step in and we're like well we have to put on a production of the tempest and teach all of these children the tempest <laughs> in two weeks really no rules everybody gets to do um a little bit of something and like that is really where i mean personally like, that's where i was coming from like what are spaces where you know they're is a great opportunity for learning outside of what is traditionally like accepted as a classroom. And Shakespeare happened in uh, in a town hall in <laughs> in a town in Western Mass. So um, I think learning can exist in so many different places and in like so many different ways. And um, I think partially like what. Olivia and I were thinking of is like how do we make computer science as approachable as possible and how much and how much fun can people have doing it um when oftentimes like it it is like seen as a really like rigid or scary thing and maybe from this they can like take a leap into a more like structured learning experience but yeah a lot of Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of, um, especially between ages like 16 and 24, which was kind of the age range we had in mind for this particular curriculum. There's so many places you can be if you want to like engage with this kind of work in an institutional setting. Um, and one of the things that especially in like 20, the 21st century, that we realized a lot of youth in that age range are missing are these like third spaces that aren't school and aren't their house um where they can engage with other youth and they can like explore you know who they are and like, what they're gonna do and be um there's like a really pivotal amount of just like self-actualization that um like what kelly and i know from experience that you know theater can give you just in terms of like understanding yourself as um I'm using the word actor here but I don't just mean actor in a performance sense but actor in the sense of someone who is like an agent of an agent of change <laughs> in your community um and specifically like the things that you do um like matter around the world around you um a lot of our experiences with technology really encourage us to you know, think that our experience is isolated and think that um, kind of the things that we do in cyberspace don't affect the real world. Um, so having a space, a learning space that is really firmly in the real world, um, that kind of asks you to be who you are outside of your house and outside of your school um, is a demand that's not really made of high school and college students super often. Um, and so that was a really big um that was a really big feeling in terms of like, we weren't really sure if we wanted to, you know, go the more traditional, you know, school route, or if we wanted to lean into being an alternative space and being kind of a more flex space. Um, but it also, one of the things that um, we realized as we continued to like ideate and iterate on the kind of games and curriculum we were building is that not being inside of a classroom also like allows you to like shift the dynamic of power between the students and their environment because oftentimes when you step into a classroom you're sitting at a desk and you're in a certain posture and you're facing the front and you're seeing the backs of the heads of the people you're with um and the teachers at the front with you know a whiteboard or a screen and they're kind of speaking to you in that very like one to all like transmitter um quality which is like 
exactly the dynamic that we're trying to get students to kind of glitch and confront is that kind of like transmitter one to all relationship um, and to think of ways of relating that are more local and peer to peer and distributed. Um, and so I think being able to walk into a classroom and like not yet know how to sit and have to na navigate a choreography of where to sit, who to talk to, um, of having a teacher that doesn't necessarily stand in the board, but stands among you and walks around with you and does the activities with you um, in that way, um, I think kind of just makes, makes things feel like more fertile um, and less scary. Well, scary, I think also, um, yeah, I think one of the things that was probably the biggest like thing that we realized upon making it is that a lot of the ideas of like what made computer science approachable wasn't necessarily about what made it less difficult, um, but what made it more um, tangible, um, which was something, especially when working with older students who don't necessarily need a beginner's curriculum, but they do need an accessible curriculum and kind of detaching like the idea of like um like easy versus hard from accessible versus inaccessible because those are actually different things and oftentimes a lot of like the experiences that we had in more like accessible coding spaces ended up being alienating because of this like infantilization of their audience so I think being in a third space also allowed us to kind of um, confront the students both also as experts of their own experience and like engage with them as like not just students but also like people who have things to teach us as well just like a little bit on that I think Liam like your curriculum does a really good job at like meeting students at like an intermediate level like where they are and I really respect that like not like there there are there is so much beginner curriculum out there and I like that you pointed out that you know like this this is where I want to meet people without like watering it down like and like I think that your work is like really expanding um like the audience and of who can do like an intermediate project with processing and it really helped it would really help students envision like where processing can take their sound projects thank you yeah that's definitely something my aim was I just thought what you two like the when you first talked about your project when we all met like throwing out theater as sort of the the medium in which to engage in coding I was just totally fascinated by that and it's love hearing about what you're saying I think two things you said Kelly of like you had two weeks to like put on a performance like theater to me is like the assessment is just like okay we got a show to put on and like the curtain's going to open and it's just like that's the end point and it's either going to be amazing or it's going to be a train wreck or but it's just like there's a very finite point of theater that I think sort of goes well in terms of like a teaching sort of format where it's just like okay this is the test to like get on stage and do it and then Olivia what you're saying about like um this third space and like real world it's like theater is not there's I don't can't think of another medium where it's like has to be in person almost like it sort of forces you into that space of like you can't do theater remotely you know like it can't be something you do over your phone or over a zoom it's just like it absolutely has to be a real world space in which you engage in and I think yeah that is a very interesting way to kind of force people to engage in code or not force but allow them to engage in code Okay, thanks y'all. <laughs> um, deeply appreciate it. We can stop recording here. That was delightful. Do y'all have, a, was there final thoughts outside of that? That felt like a great ending place. Yeah, that was you good. You feel good? Okay.